<laughs> okay, is the microphone working? Okay, so, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, thanks first of all to, to David uh, for putting up some pressure for me and the talk. Um, and, and thanks to the organizers for, for having me in this, in this session as a kind of a slightly off-topic computer scientist. So I'll be talking about some work we're doing in the, in the, in the previous years with, with um, PhD students of, of mine um, on parallelization and software concepts for yeah, primarily dynamically adaptive uh, mesh refinement with tri using triangular grids. And the target application is tsunami simulation in, um, come on, featuring a joint project with. Uh, you have to change it to the refresh rate. Okay. Um, Where do I do this? This one? Yes. Hi. Hi. Sixty hertz? Forty? No, it should be 60. <laughs> it's not on there. What it says, it's 660. Change it. The resolution. Yeah, try that one. Okay, so let's take the time until it fails again. Um, yeah, okay, so as I said, the uh, topic is still there. Um, motivation is, um, should probably better switch the laptop, right? Yeah, um, there, there is a center laptop, which I guess will change the resolution so you get it works. Rearrange, I will just attach my. Whilst we're waiting, can I just make a quick announcement? Um, I heard very recently that we've just been funded to have a network in climate modeling um, using mathematical methods. This is an ESRC network, and um, that network needs to start in um, the end of this year, and as a result, we'll be having a series of, of, of workshops funded by EPSRC um, looking at mathematical methods of climate modeling. So I'm going to let you all know about when these are happening, so hopefully you can become part of this network. It's called ClimathNet, ClimathNet, and I'll be sending more information to the organizers. Um, so these will be workshops, they'll be coming a couple of workshops a year. Um, and this is a collaborative project with the Hadley Centre and various other climate centres. Hopefully we're nearly there. Um, while we're having a brief break, 
Um, I'm sitting in a position where I have a great view of that screen up there, and they keep flashing up the end of week reminders. So if you are leaving the center this afternoon, please do all the things that are on the screen and don't go wandering off with their keys or cards or other things that will cause bureaucrats to worry. Okay, sorry about this. So usually my laptop is well behaved, um, but probably not. Yeah, that's very well behaved. I think it's the uh, thing up there. Okay, so I, I, I was about to, to start with motivation. So our motivation is um, the uh, kind of a, a scenario provided by tsunami simulation for parallel adaptive mesh refinement. So what we want to do is if we have such a propagating um, tsunami wave front, we will try to uh, adapt on the uh, on the wave front, the propagating wave front, and um, if you kind of try to to really keep the highest resolution along the front, you will have to update the mesh in, in every time step, otherwise you risk that you run with a shop front into an under-resolved um, area. So uh, this uh, would be uh, this requirement below here that you want to do be able to to do remeshing in almost every time step um, and even more so there's a, a scenario for refinement when you want to simulate inundation um, like in this example it's really uh, probably only an illustration from a from a Cartesian computed by a Cartesian um, um, code um, but also at the at the coastlines uh, you would like to do a very fine resolution, but of course only, or preferably only once the um, wave actually arrives there. Um, so the kind of computational setting and parallel AMR setting that how, how we view it on that is kind of guided by these five, five issues, principles, so by the kind of challenges this, this um, application poses for grid refinement and coarsening, frequent remeshing, that we have a substantial change of the problem size also during simulation. So you've seen, I think, uh, such a plot that, that Jörn has showed us. Um, that there's kind of reaching a plateau. You have an early situation where the simulation size rises, then you reach a plateau. And then if you want to simulate inundation, you probably have another such a, a rising step. Um, so that would be challenges from the grid refinement part. Um, you have challenges from the architectural side. So what I like to, to focus on there is the so-called memory wall, so that the growth of CPU speed is really outrunning heavily that of, of memory speed. So if you look um, at the recent 20 years or so, memory latency, kind of the first access to an, a remote um, and, and, un, and kind of random access byte in a word in memory, so that speed has improved by about 5% per year compared to a 60% improvement or doubling about every one and a half years for CPU speed. So that memory gap that you have is kind of, uh, yeah, doubling every maybe let's say 14 or 15 months. Um, so when you want to worry about speed for codes in the next 10 years or so or algorithms, you definitely want to minimize the memory requirements and the memory footprint, so the amount of memory you access during your uh, um, simulation. And also you want to improve stuff like loca locality properties of your, of your uh, access patterns. You want to go to stream access so that you are actually limited by memory bandwidth and not by latency. So it's kind of improve the entire memory behavior of your, of your algorithm. Um, there is, of course, a huge trend for parallelization. Um, so there we want to feed f focus on, on dynamic load balancing, naturally, due to that uh, changing computational load that we have. Um, interesting problems that arise in, in such methods is maybe if you use local time stepping. So that's nothing that we started yet, but what we should, what would like to do in the, in the very near future. Um, there's huge challenges for, for the for building the software. So Robert has actually talked a little bit about that. So the Dune approach, I think they're much, much farther than, than we would be in that direction. Um, and well, our approach to tackle these things is kind of structured around um, structured adaptive grids because we, 
we believe that any, any structure is likely to help you in, in tackling these challenges. And so we, we are based on our newest vertex bisection refinement. We are using Sierpinski space filling curves. Jörn has told about this already a bit, and I will detail, give more details on that. Um, how we exploit this for cache, and cache locality and parallel efficiency. Yeah, and uh, what I will tell about, especially today, is this uh, comparison of maybe classical and more novel parallelization approaches for this. Um, so first, a quick look at the, at the AMR scheme. So I think this basically no, very schematic. So you start with initial triangular grid. So this is only one grid cell shown here, or one coarse grid uh, initial cell. And then by recursive bisection, you would refine the grid. And you can um, actually, you could describe or visualize this refinement by a corresponding binary uh, refinement tree, as shown to the left. This refinement can be adaptive and which gives you such an unbalanced uh, refinement tree. And you want to throw in the, the Sierpinski curve. Sierpinski curve is a sequential order on such a triangular grid. And the interesting thing is that it corresponds with a binary tree. Uh, in the case, if you do a, a, a depth-first traversal of this tree, um, you will exactly traverse the the grid cells in this uh, Sierpinski order. So um, that is the, so in, in, in our later algorithm will be strongly based on traversals, or it will be entirely built around traversals of, of this binary tree. But I also have to say at this time that we do not necessarily build up that tree, or do not necessarily have uh, recursive traversals as our um, as our uh, kind of coding scheme. But the, the real idea is to, to have this traversals and tree traversals as the guiding principle. Um, in principle, this could give you minimum requirements of, of something like one bit per tree node. But because the, the kind of neighbor properties, neighborship properties of the grid cells, where they are in space, and so this is all encoded in the tree structure. Um, in practice, you probably want to invest some more um, bytes of memory just to, to be more efficient, to have it more, more handy in programming. Um, but you come by with really very low memory requirements. And that is, in my opinion, one of the, the largest advantages that this method shares, of course, with, with Quadri, with Octree, and, and any kind of these tree structured refinement approaches. Um, what we especially have to solve for, for our grid refinement is. Um, for example, if you want to have conforming grid refinement, um, we have to make sure that if we refine such a grid, information on this refinement is propagated um, to the adiation cells. So there can be such a refinement cascade, actually. And that refinement cascade um, can actually tra transfer in the direction of the curve, but also um, backward in, in your traversal direction. So this is a very early part of the traversal, and here's kind of the late part of the version. So what you have to do, do several traversals of your grid to propagate this refinement information. And it actually requires exchange of data between neighboring um, grid cells. And um, for that exchange, and of course, you have the same exchange when you want to do flux computations. You need the unknowns in neighboring grid cells to compute fluxes for finite volume or discontinuous Galerkin methods. Um, in, the, in the grid cells. And if you want to um, accumulate residuals and finite element methods, you would have to um, combine information from radiation cells to maybe collect a residual value on such a vertex. Um, so this really comes down to exchanging data between grid cells that are neighbors in space but can be far apart in, 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 in terms of the traversal um, order. and um, we solve this by a, by a so-called stack property. Um, that means so if you see this blue traversal order along the space filling curve, you can see, for example, for these three edges, if you access these um, three cells, you see that the, the edges are accessed in ABC order, in upward order. And when you traverse them downwards on the other side, they are traversed in backside order. So you get a last in, first out principle, which is exactly a stack. Yeah, and you have actually two stacks, 
two systems of stacks, the green one and the red one system, which correspond to the left-hand and right-hand side of the, of the space filling curve. Um, so our final um, processing scheme is in the end such a thing. So we will stream in grid cells along this space filling order. And we also will um, stream in edge-based and vertex-based data at such streams. And they are kind of streamed in in a first access pattern. So the first time I access these things, I have to read them from the stream. And they are explicitly, sto explicitly stored in that order. I will have an intermediate system of a, a system of stacks that will do intermediate storage that will exchange the values between adjacent grid cells. And once I, I, I'm finished with the processing of an edge, of a vertex, of a cell, I will write it to an output stream. And this is actually a last touch um, order that I'm doing. When I last touch a vertex or an edge, I write it to the output stream. And one of the interesting things that can be shown is that this order here is exactly the right order to do everything backwards in a backward traversal. So if you run to the one side and run to the back side, you have these streams in precisely the same order to write the data back and forth. Um, so what you actually do is that you skip the requirement having a fixed positions of your unknown in memory. So unknowns live in streams. And you do not write, there is no fixed position. This unknown is written to that particular space in memory. You just live in streams. And that, of course, gives you the opportunity to add cells or delete cells when you refine or coarsen that. So in that way, you can retain the Sierpinski order of the unknowns despite constant refinement and coarsening. And, and that is the, the idea on that. Um, so this is dedicated to David, actually. So that, um, how, how do we organize this in, in, in the software? So Oliver Meister, one of my PhD students, did a kind of a layer concept there. So you have a grid layer that does this grid modifications and traversal implementations. You have a hook layer. This hook layer for us is this um, kind of the first touch, last touch operators. Some edge appears on the first time. It has to be read from the input stream. So all this log it logic is given on the hook layer. And then we have uh, this kernel layer on top of it. And the kernel layer was inspired by Dune, so as in, in context of a, of, a, of a project that, that we started for this um, in Stuttgart. Um, didn't finish so far, you'll we'll have to see. And this has so-called volume and skeleton kernels. So a volume kernel would execute the element operator of a discretization um, scheme and skeleton operators would have the, an edge, the two neighboring um, grid cells, um, and would kind of execute something like a flux computation on this. There are a couple of uh, differences between our concept because we cannot, as Jörn said in his talk, we cannot write to a grid cell that, is, that, has, been, that has already gone by in the stream. That doesn't work. We can always only write to one grid cell in the stream. So that gives a couple of restrictions, but they can typically handle it. Um, yeah, and uh, interesting, from my point of view, consequence of this is, is sense of a lifetime of, of variables. So for example, the typical unknowns in, in um, yeah, tsunami simulations, the water height, it's the momentum variables. So these are, of course, persistent. So they would be stored on stacks and streams. But things like residuals, flux variables, and so on are preferably non-persistent. So you would like to compute them on the fly and not store them permanently. So you might create them by a first touch hook and destroy them when they uh, have been used by the last adiation element. It would be just two such elements for, a, for an edge computation, for a flux computation. And otherwise, you wouldn't store them on the, or you would only like to store them on these intermediate color stacks, which are one-dimensional in nature and, and, and kind of small. So this is not totally possible, but um, at least to, to some extent possible. You have to store a couple of, of edges persistently. But for example, an interesting consequence is that um, we typically do not store old and new values of the unknowns. So you can overwrite um, unknowns by the new values when you write them to the output stream. So you do not have this new, uh, yeah, unknown at time point n, unknown at time point n plus one, and two sets of 
variables and maybe exchanging them after each time. So that's not what we have. So we have uh, really an overwriting of the, of the unknowns and it's a consequence of really knowing when you touch an unknown for the last time. Um, yeah, I said I wanted to show a little bit on, on parallelization. We have actually two approaches for that. Um, we have actually two approaches for many things, so that's resulting at the moment in two codes as well. So this is the code by Kavi Rahnema and Oliver Meister called Samoa. <coughs> and, and there they, they perform a really classical cutting into equal sized partitions thing, space filling curve. Um, gives you a uniform load balancing, gives you compact partitioning due to Herder community continuity that was shown by, by um, Gerhard Zumbusch and kind of robust towards the changes of the grid that works pretty well. And for our stack scheme, that means that we actually duplicate the stacks at partition boundaries. So we have, we build up two boundary stacks at these partition boundaries during the traversals and after the traversals you exchange um, these values. Um, for example, you can write the normal um, components on these stacks that you, that you need to do flux computations and then you would do the flux computation um, on both sides again, as, as Robert said, um, on the, uh, but on both processors. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a dynamical ghost layer scheme. So you could interpret this as a, as a kind of a ghost layer where the ghost layer is just written to the stack. But it's very similar in concept to a ghost layer. But you can kind of um, steer what, what values you really need to write on the stack. Um, yeah, I, I already said that. Uh, this is a, a very simple uh, test scenario that we did. It's kind of a radial dam break problem, basic shallow water metal, um, finite volume, piecewise constant with flux free leaf flux. So it's um, very simplistic, but it also provides kind of the lowest possible computational load. Um, and we're at least not guilty of kind of uh, covering bad scalability with heavy computational load per processor, so that's uh, not, but what we can do, we can do really large simulations of that um, with, with really lots of millions of grid cells. Um, there are nice results in there where you get to um, reload balance by just firing your stream into the next processor. That works. Can you, can you repeat the start? So when you, because obviously you're doing dynamic load balancing there, right? Yeah. This, it, does it fall out that the way you load balance is basically by transmitting chunk, a chunk of your stream to your neighbor if you yeah, have you, too much? You can kind of, um, well, what you, there's a couple of things you can do. You can just recompute the uh, kind of from, from the total number of grid cells. You can say, okay, I, I need that many grid cells. I have this partition and then I send everything else to neighbors. I, but you can also have something like a sharing, say I know the the number of grid cells of my predecessor and my successor in the Sierpinski sequence, and then say, okay, I, I exchange half of the dis difference between these numbers. So that would lead like to a diffusion-oriented exchange of grid cells, and that give, doesn't give you an immediate yeah. um, exchange, but it, it was shown that the, usually, the, at least in such simple settings, you see that the, the, the number of grid cells doesn't change that much from one step to the next. I mean, as, as I said, we want to do repartitioning after each or each second time step. Yeah. We want to do it pretty often and then the number of cells doesn't change that often and such a diffusion thing would be would be sufficient. Yeah, this is this is uh, in, in principle not, not a bad result, but I'm, I I do really don't like what well, you can guess what I don't like about the result. <laughs> this is very apparent. There's a there's a kind of a nasty kink at the eighty processors everything else is, is scaling well pretty nicely. So that's the speed up what we get on, on, a, on a kind of a pretty normal Nihalem cluster at, at the LRZ. Um, this is a, a, a breakdown of these, um, of that kink to the, to the uh, different phases in our, in our computation. So you see it shows up in the computation and in preserving the adaptivity. So that's kind of the um, conforming yeah, preserving conformity and um, it doesn't show up in load balance. So we, we didn't really find that and at the moment we are restructuring the code. So um, yeah, don't, don't really have, have an answer have to that. Yeah? Boxes. You don't have any chance to have eight, eight boxes in a rack. Like 
that that drop isn't suddenly when you go off. With off ten track. cores. But you have eight cores in each thing, and it, it happens really in a similar way on another machine as well. So I don't think it's the machine. I would like to be to be the machine, but it, I have the. <laughs> I really fear that it isn't. <laughs> What's the ratio of the load balancing compared to the numerics? Ah, uh, the load balancing is, um, it depends. The load balancing itself is cheap. Exchanging the values is cheap. <laughs> what, is, uh, more ex oops, what is more expensive is, is con uh, establishing the conformity. That is the bigger part. So you iterate between processes there? Or? Yeah. There's a, another approach that we, we started, which is um, oriented towards shared memory parallelization, which is done by Martin Schreiber on a, on a, on a different code, actually, as well. And there, the idea is that you, that you do parallelization in a tree-oriented way, and you cut off subtrees. Um, and actually, his approach is that you, you cut off really many subtrees. So you um, kind of go down to sizes of maybe 1,000, 2,000 elements per subtree. Um, and then you have, well, if you have a million, couple of million um, uh, grid cells, you have really much more s such small subtree partitions than you would have cores. And then you schedule the partitions to the available cores in a dynamical way. So our goal is there is twofold. Um, first, we want to, to tolerate imbalances in the computational load per element. So if we have, for example, when, when if you look at Riemann solvers by Randy Levesque, they sometimes have a really different behavior on how much effort they spend for certain situations. For example, inundation situation can be much more difficult to compute. Um, we also, same thing would happen if you have local time stepping, for example. There might be a different number of small elements in each grid, so that and this is really difficult to predict how much computational load you have per element. So this dynamical approach is, is kind of intended to, to deal with this, um, not knowing my exact computational load. And another point is, and that was the motivation of, on the project size, is that we want to be able to tolerate a variable number of cores. So we want to be able to change the number of cores that we use throughout the computation, increase it when we have more load due to simulation. But it could also be, for example, that you say, I want to dedicate two or three cores or one core to writing an output and go on computation at the same time, but with one core less. And this should be tolerated. And that is the idea behind that, that scheme. Um, it's, as I said, a, a, um, a, a shared memory um, scheme. It turned out that the communication structure is much more easy because you have these simple kind of uh, triangle-shaped partitions because a subtree will geometrically be a triangle. Um, you have easier migration of load between the core. Well, now it's shared memory. That's easy as well. But it would also be easier if you go to, sh to, to uh, MPI. And what we saw is that it's really difficult to have NUMA-aware scheduling. And, and we saw that, for example, threading building blocks is, is kind of able to handle this. But also, we're showing up some, some problems with that. So this is a, a runtime speed up result that we got. It's gone over. over machine on a, on a node that has four Intel 10 core machines that offer dual hyper threading so, so two, two threads per core so we did this computations up to 80 cores uh, which you see that it, it doesn't really help you much going beyond the 40 cores physical cores that you have but you see that up to 20 30 cores we really get a, a nice result and then there's a couple of, of things that impede us so it might range from from uh, kind of uh, NUMA effects that play a role that we can't really control yet um, and, and, and other stuff. Um, what's nice, though, is that if you look at this, at the, at the coordinate here, that's mega triangles per second, million triangles per second. That's the throughput. So how many millions of triangles per second can you compute? And so it's uh, 50 to 60 million triangles per second on a, on a compute node. And I think that's that's a pretty pretty large value in that sense. Um, yeah, this is an example um, we just recently um, submitted to the multi-core challenge. Um, this is uh, four simulations sharing the cores. And here you see that they, at different times, the simulations have different sizes. And they are uh, assigned to with different number of cores. 
based on such a scheduling component that, that Martin um, implemented for this purpose. Yeah, a little bit on, on current and future work. So what we would like to do is um, go into this, so have adap adaptive simulations of kind of realistic problems. We have some first versions where you, where you do the simulation, um, place some buoys, and uh, well, I, I made it real small because it's really just an illustration yet. So we, we have lots of work to do to, to kind of uh, improve the models. But that's what we want to do in the, in the next months to really see, okay, how does this adaptivity compare, for example, <coughs> to what is done in, in GeoClaw in the software with um, block-oriented adaptive mesh refinement. And also a goal would be to, to obtain good scenarios for ensemble runs, like to, to see whether such a, a sharing of cores can give you a better overall throughput of when you do um, really a sequence or a parameter study or so. Um, yeah, I will probably uh, have to skip this um, and um, come back with what kind of a yeah, summary, so we think that the structured adaptive bridge refinement will, will allow us to kind of simulate in a fully adaptive way, in a dynamical adaptive way, meshes with more than one million elements per core in, in, a, in a fast and efficient way. Goal is to maintain data locality with these values filling curves really on all scales. Um, memory, shared and distributed memory using these uh, space filling curves for the respective uh, works and projects and software uh, projects that we will do so especially is a project ASKIT. Um, we want to do coupled tsunami and earthquake events together with Jörn Behrens and Martin Kaeser and Louis Dahlgren who are in the, in the earthquake um, simulations and seismology fields. Yeah, and the other part I already mentioned. Okay, this is a couple of, of, of recent papers that we did on this. Yeah, thanks and Somehow in time. Well, you said that you had <coughs> a lot of time with the adaptation, and that because of the nature of your tsunami forecast, you had to do an ad adaptation every time step. Yeah. Tsunamis are incredibly predictable when they'll be in the neighborhood. Could you anticipate where you would need to do adaptation several time steps in advance with, say, a very coarse resolution, quick and dirty? estimate of where the tsunami is likely to be so as to save having to do the adaptation every time step? Um, we, we, we probably could. Um, maybe Jörn could comment on this better than me. Um, from, from my opinion, I, I don't really care. <laughs> so um, so I, I, would, I would actually throw, I, I mean, that's, that's a modeling point that where, where I take anything that, that people throw at me. So our goal would be that we can, from a computational efficiency point of view, we are able to do the, um, the refinement and coarsening and load balancing as often as we wish, and that we're not forced to do it not as often as we can afford due to computational costs. So th that would be my goal. If it turns out that, I, that I'm fine doing it less, open, well, uh, less often, well, then we do it less often. But my primary goal would be to kind of open the possibility to really do it each time. So. I mean, Matt talked about metric advection on Wednesday, and I guess it's metric wave propagation, but it's a sort of similar concept. Um, there's a question over here. Actually, I just want you to flip over the use a couple of slides back. You skipped a slide. I'll just yeah. Uh, that one. Uh, uh, that's something, actually, yeah, we had a math student programming this, so the, the motivation for us was that when you do the adaptive refinement and coarsening, um, so you need, for example, the bathymetry data when you refine, you want to have the bathymetry data for the refined cells. And um, rather than then kind of keep this in, in our mesh and in whatever, we set up a, a server parallel server that has the information on a, on, a, on a local grid and where you can just send in information, okay, give me the bathymetry at this coordinates, and you can also specify the level, a level of detail when you say, okay, this resolution. And then the server will answer with that um, value, and uh, the parallel server takes into account um, that when your partitions move to another 
um, point in, in space, you would need another part of the data. So the data is stored in a distributed way on your machine, and the um, and the patches of data automatically migrate um, to other yeah, processes, MPI processes, when you need them somewhere else. So all of this parallelization happens in the back. So it's kind of a nice idea, and we will see how it really helps. <laughs> We haven't fully, it's just running since a month or so, but it's a nice idea that we wanted to test. And the, the diagram you see here is kind of an, an access pattern for a, uh, actually a still sequential simulation. So you see here you have lots of those image requests along a coastline, and this is not really visible. It's kind of a, a kind of a cone that is coming up, and this is this propagating wavefront in time. So this is a, so the, the vertical axis here is the time axis. Um, I could ask questions all afternoon, but I'm not going to <laughs> subject you all to that. Um, so, should we break now for coffee and we're going to recommence in half an hour? Yeah.